I'm calling the Capital Investment Committee hearing for March 18th is to order. Um, we don't have a quorum yet. Um, when we do, we'll move the. We'll have a motion to move approve the minutes. We're going to start with these. We'll okay. Them All right. Members, today we'll be hearing presentations on the governor's 2024 bonding recommendations and bonding requests for the Minnesota Department of Human Services, Department of Administration, Minnesota Education Department, Amateur Sports Commission, Minnesota Zoo, and others. Um, so first is um, Department of Minnesota Zoo. Okay. Would you introduce yourself? Yeah, we're gonna, um, Mr. Chair, committee members, thank you. I'm John Frawley, director of the Minnesota Zoo, and just uh, we have a guest today with us. Uh, I'll let Donnie just do a quick, uh, brief introduction, and then we'll send her back to the zoo. Uh, my name is Donnie Crook. I am actually a naturalist here at the Minnesota Zoo, and I love my job. I actually go to schools, libraries. I do the show on site, and this is one of the great animals I get to work with. This is a striped skunk, one of the cool animals you can find right here in Minnesota. And these guys, they actually are one of the coolest animals because kids, they know that they smell. And that's about all that they know. So these guys they actually are very cute also, and they love to eat lots and lots of different things. So we do have really cool animals right here in Minnesota that I think our zoo really does a really good job at presenting all of those amazingly cool animals. And I think this one is going to go right back to the zoo. Hopefully she will go right back into our little crate here. <laughs> she's, she's mowing down. Yeah, one of the hardest parts of my job. I can't make this animal do anything through through training, through other things like that. We can oh, ask these oh, animals oh, to do oh, things, oh, and just like that, they will do it well. So thank you guys for letting me bring my skunk here today. Thank you. Mr. Frawley, why don't you introduce yourself and proceed? Yes, Mr. Chair, John Frawley, Director of the Minnesota Zoo. With me today, I do have Abby uh, Moser, our COO, and Missy McGrath, our Legislative Directors. Um, but thank you and the committee for your time this, morning, or this afternoon. First thing, I just thought just a little refresher of the Minnesota Zoo. Um, our mission is to connect people to animals like we just did and the natural world to save wildlife. Uh, the zoo is no longer a new zoo. The zoo was established in 1978, almost 48 years old. We're the fifth largest zoo in the country at over 485 acres. Most zoos are less than 60 acres. We're 500 acres. Um, reminder of our operating budget, one third of our, approximately one third of our funding comes from the state. Two thirds uh, we raise ourselves through earned revenue, um, food, beverage events, and so forth. So a little bit of a main street in ourselves that we have to raise two thirds of our our own revenue. I will say that this year the zoo is on a record pace. After 48 years, the Minnesota Zoo is uh, on record to have the highest attendance in its history, up 1.5 million visitors, um, reaching over 100,000 school kids, and over uh, over 200,000 200, um, people are now coming to the zoo for free through our Free to Explore program, where if you qualify for general assistance, uh, you now can come to the zoo. Uh, for free of admission, uh, and over 200,000 Minnesotans have taken part in that. Uh, so I, it's nice to say that I think the Minnesotans are enjoying the zoo more than ever this year, after all those years. To our presentation today, um, Mr. Chair, committee members, we had specific questions that we, that we were asked of you to a answer, so we put, uh, put these straight forward to give you your answers. Regarding the 2023 asset preservation um, questions obviously how much is spent or encumbered how much of this is obligated in terms of the, of a projects and planned and procurement or contracting and what do you have queued up for completion uh, if you remember last session the minnesota zoo had two critically two critical emergency projects that after 50 years uh, we had to address one, and this was one of them that's, um, for this, this asset preservation address one, the Lakeside Plaza project is the main plaza around the entire center of the Minnesota Zoo's main lake. Um, and this project pretty much answers all those questions. It, it's dedicated um, uh, to this project. We have hired owners or reps. We have 
begun initial pre-design um, and we will direct all these funds to make sure we fulfill this Lakeside project. Uh, this project was critical because uh, it was putting us out of compliance for safety and egress and access to the zoo and we would have had to been closed if we did not address it. So thank you for the support here. Good. Regarding 2023 capital funding, we received 1.225. Uh, what is the project timeline? This was was a appropriation that addressed that second issue that we had, that second critical problem we had at the Minnesota Zoo. And that is we have a 50 year old animal hospital that's not currently um, adequate for the maintaining uh, support for the 5,000 animals that we have at the zoo. So that is put towards immediate design and planning for the animal hospital. Um, and that, that is underway as we speak. We have gone through different phases of design. I'll share a little bit of, with that with you of that project today. Regarding the 2024 recommendations, what's the governor's asset preservation amount and what will it fund? Here's a list. Uh, bridge decking safeties. I might start by saying the Minnesota Zoo has over $40 million of asset preservation. Uh, so there's a significant amount that's building over the last 50 years. But here's four categories of, of, of primary focus for us that would be used with this recommendation. Bridges and decking, obsolete HVAC, life support systems, roofs, safety concerns, roads, pathways, and parking lots. Follow-up question from the committee um, for the 2024 recommendations. Will the asset preservation amount be expended? When will it be expended? Um, one half could be obligated in the first six months. The rest will be obligated within a year. And all these projects you know, could be completed in less than two years. Finally, the quest last question you asked of us, 2024 recommendations, not asset preservation. And that would fall into our, our critical concern of the new animal hospital need at the Minnesota Zoo cover that project. I appreciate a lot of the committee members and committee chairs uh, that you all came out and saw the hospital in its current state. It's almost a 49 year old hospital. It has not been modernized. It's inadequate in its current condition. Um, it predates the opening of the zoo. Uh, no longer meets industry standards. Uh, poses a lot of risks to both the animals and humans. Um, and the animal hospital is a core product. Um, obviously, when you have 5,000 animals, an animal hospital is critical. A lot of our procedures right now are being done, done in the field. Well, a reminder of your visit, the outside enclosures are dilapidated. Um, loading dock is how we're getting you know, these 5,000 animals in and out all seasons, which is inadequate for a modern hospital and modern day hospital. And we're having critical system failures that, that PVC just recently broke in a in a, under, um, we were having a, um, a Wolverine procedure, uh, emergency surgery, and that blew up right during the procedure and busted in the middle, middle of the procedure. So things like this are unacceptable we need to have addressed. Moving forward, we do have initial designs for a state-of-the-art modern hospital. Um, you know, a hospital where all the animals and the patients um, thrive and are safe. Um, the other thing about the designs and direction of this new animal hospital mm -hmm. that we're proposing for the Minnesota Zoo is that we're gonna build it for more than just the zoo. Uh, as you can see by this rendering, there's a vin window of kids looking into the treatment room. Um, this whole hospital will be designed for Minnesota to be able to come be part of it. Um, we'll invite high schools, colleges, visiting veterinarians, host conferences, uh, so it will be a teaching hospital uh, and really provide return on investment for all of Minnesota. One of the other things that I think this hospital is going to achieve is you can see here, uh, you know, having mobility to go out and, and serve animals, not only at the zoo, but we will be planning to support animals throughout Minnesota as needed, case by case. Um, so what we're saying is in Minnesota, we don't need multiple exotic species hospitals here at the zoo. If we build this one right with mobile units, we can go out and help other organizations 
in that breath. Um, we have worked around the state, um, meeting with our colleagues, you know, starting at the University of Minnesota Medical Facilities, the veterinary care, uh, looking at em entering into a partnership with, with the 200 students that are learning vet medicine at the University of Minnesota. Uh, we went up to Ely and visited our colleagues up there, Duluth, you know, Midwalkington Tribe. All these, all these facilities are, are excited and support this request as we have multiple relationships with them in helping their animals and their collections as well. So once again, it, it'll be a teaching hospital that supports a lot of organizations throughout the state. Finally, I think one of the biggest things I think a lot of you probably realize is that there's a huge veterinarian crisis across the country, but it's hitting Minnesota really hard. Lack of veterinarians, both in dogs, cats, but a lot of ag vets are, uh, there's huge shortages. This hospital will help to attract, educate, and retain more veterinarians here in Minnesota. So uh, it's a critical need for the zoo for us to be, have a core, a core part of our business, um, but we've also gone forward with this design to make sure it really serves more than just a zoo, and it's something that will help Minnesota across the board. With that said, Mr. Chair, um, many members, it is a $35 million bonding request, um, and we thank you for the planning the money that has brought us to, to where we are today. The other thing I can add, I think I've met with a lot of committee members. The zoo also has launched a, a private capital campaign and so parallel to the bonding session, we will be trying to raise private dollars to bring that $35 million request down. Um, I can say to date, we, we just received a $2.5 million request, so that's a good step. In, and we have a $5 million ask that looks promising, uh, but we will be working right through session to bring that, that request down and working with you and the committees um, to keep you updated on how successful that, that private campaign can be through the session. So that's our goal is to try to, we know you have a lot of requests. This is an emergency um, and we're trying to address it with all means possible. So with that, Mr. Chair, I could open up for questions. Thank you, Mr. Frawley. Any questions from members? Uh, Mr. Representative Krause. I just only have one. How did the surgery turn out for that Wolverine? Thank you, Mr. Chair, committee members. We were able to make that surgery happen. We, we have a little bit of backup equipment just because of the situation we're in. We're very careful. Um, but it was, it's those types of things that we're trying to avoid in the future. You know, being a world-class zoo and people love the zoo, but with, you know, all it takes is an accident, an animal's life, an incident with a human. This is the liability that's in front of us right now. Thank you, Mr. Chair. If there's, if there's one critter I can admire, it's a Wolverine. <laughs> <laughs> Wolverine. All right. Thank you, Mr. Frawley. Appreciate it. Next is Nancy Freeman. And while she's getting set up, could I have a motion to approve the minutes from March 13th? I move. Thank you. All, all in favor? Any discussion? No. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion passes. Thank you. Uh, could you identify yourself, please? Sure. Good morning, or good afternoon, Mr. Chair and members. Uh, Nancy Freeman had a family emergency he had to deal with. I'm Dan Storkamp, Director of Operations Services for Direct Care and Treatment. My name is Carrie Briones. I'm the Legislative Director for Direct Care and Treatment. You may proceed. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair and members, uh, thank you for the opportunity to present today. Uh, the uh, the Department of Human Services is uh, providing a request for three different components today. Um, and when you start thinking about the bonding pieces, uh, uh, buildings and roofs and sewers and all of that, if with DHS we're actually uh, providing support for people and uh, individuals in the process. They are treatment uh, in all our sites as well as uh, the children that uh, we're asking for for DHS and as we proceed. Our uh, bonding really uh, fits within three areas. It's safety and security, it's uh, for the low-income families with children, and then it preserves and uh, mm -hmm. improves the infrastructure. 
the top three projects for DCT uh, are, as, are for DHS are asset preservation, early childhood family facilities, as well as the sewer and water construction at St. Peter. Uh, I will begin with the asset preservation piece. I think uh, this uh, committee is very aware. Direct care and treatment has nearly 200 sites around the state, uh, about 3 million square feet, as well as $1 billion in uh, replacement value. We currently have 185 million that are in deferred uh, maintenance, and the uh, 12 million that we're asking for here, the 12.2 million, uh, gets us a part of the way there as we kind of proceed. Uh, there's a lot of uh, needs that uh, if you don't address the infrastructure pieces, uh, it gets worse every year. So this is, because of our big deferred uh, maintenance area, this is one of those areas that's real critical that we get moving forward and, and start with. Uh, DCT has, uh, DCT has uh, asset preservation in all the areas here for our prioritized, but we'll also <coughs> note that we've uh, got some estimated savings as we kind of move the process forward. So if all these are completed, we got an annual savings of about a half a million dollars in the process. Uh, this does align with the governor's strategic plan of life safety, uh, repairing existing infrastructure, and sustainability and energy uh, reductions. I'm going to turn it over to Ms. Briornis here to talk through the early childhood family section. Thank you. Would you please introduce yourself? Sure. Carrie Briornis, Legislative Director for Direct Care and Treatment. I'm just presenting the uh, early childhood facilities uh, portion of this. The governor's capital budget proposal for statewide early childhood facilities would provide $3 million in general obligation bonds and $2 million in general funds for grants to political subdivisions, tribal nations, and communities, and nonprofits to construct new early childhood facilities and renovate aging substandard facilities. These grants will help local service providers create more equitable access to child care and age appropriate high quality services to more young children and families. This does align with the governor's one Minnesota plan that prioritizes equitable outcomes for children and families and increases access to affordable, high quality child care for Minnesota families. Grants will be awarded through a competitive RFP process, which includes a 50% match of non state funds. This match is applied program wide and not necessarily to individual grants. Projects could include creating classrooms for space with restroom access, cubby storage, parent rooms prep spaces, secure entry, and indoor, outdoor, large motor skills areas. Projects may also include program collaboration among early childhood providers like Head Start, Child Care, and school-based early childhood programs. A grant for an individual facility must not exceed $500,000. If multiple programs are housed in the same facility, the project must not exceed $500,000 for each program with a maximum overall grant of $2 million for the facility. There is a great need for investments in early childhood facilities. Mm -hmm. DHS canvassed superintendents and principals throughout the state for early childhood facility project needs and received over 77 inquiries totaling over 275 million. Another survey of statewide Head Start programs identified nearly 34 million in project needs. Uh, and then you can see on the map here, since 1992, 75 projects have been completed, 57 of which were in Greater Minnesota and 18 in the seven county metro area. Last session, 2.025 million was appropriated for early childhood facility grants. Of that, 900,000 was appropriated as general obligation bonds and 1.125 million was appropriated from the general fund. RFPs have not been issued for the 2023 appropriation with hope that ca more capital funding will be appropriated during the 2024 session, resulting in approximately seven million being available to provide larger award grants or grants to more projects. Since 1992, a total of 23 million in general funds and general obligation funds have been appropriated for early childhood facilities grants. Prior to the 2023 session, this program had not received this funding since six million was appropriated in 2014. Thank you and I'll turn over to my colleague. Uh, again, uh, our third priority area is the water and sewer construction down in St. Peter. Uh, St. Peter is the oldest uh, uh, behavioral health facility in Minnesota. It was built in the 1800s. Um, it currently has a sewer system that was built in 1950. And our uh, process is gonna be looking at uh, the water, drinking water sanitation and the storm sewage. Uh, in that process. 
in uh, 2018, we had a contractor come in and do an assessment of the sewage, or just uh, the whole right. water structure behind the, uh, excuse me, St. Peter. And uh, as such, uh, they determined that there is a need to replace the water, main water line, the sanitation sewer, as well as infrastructure. And they identified this as a system failure of a high potential as we kind of move forward. <coughs> Just to give the uh, committee a sense of kind of what's been funded in the past, uh, we've had asset preservation in the past year of 9.2 million, uh, sewer, water and sewer at St. Peter to do the uh, assessment in, of 1 million, Sunrise and Tamlinson building remodel for a Minnesota sex offender program at 21 million, and then the total uh, has been encumbered about 2 million. All projects are in process at this time as we kind of move forward. So with that, Mr. Chair and members, uh, stand for questions. Thank you. Uh, members, any questions? Yes, Representative Erdahl. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. And uh, looking at the, uh, the uh, daycare facilities here, um, early childhood facilities, okay, it looks like, well, it's $5 million, and you say there's a 500,000 uh, limit? Is that correct? Chair members, yes, that's correct. Uh, yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. And uh, so I'm guessing everyone's not going to get 500,000. That would be 10 projects for the state, which is only 10. Do you have any idea uh, what the average amount uh, appropriated per uh, child care center would be? I think it's a dial a friend here. Dial, sorry, morning, a friend. Please introduce yourself. Hi, Chair Members. I'm Elise Bailey. I'm the Budget Director for the Department of Human Services. Um, to answer your question, I don't think we know that yet. Um, the 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 project will be the projects will be funded with 25% um, local funds and 75%. I, um, state funds, yeah, the non-state match will be 25%. And so taking that into consideration, you know, th that it's, that's not the only funding that will be going into funding these projects. Um, we do know there's a high demand for these projects. So we did survey um, in the last several years, um, Head Start programs and other um, child care facilities, and we got over, you know, hundreds of of uh, millions of dollars in requests or indication of, of, the, of the request. So we, we do know that there will be a lot of com uh, competition for these dollars, but we, we wouldn't know until we um, put out the RFP as far as like how much each project would be. Mr. Chair? Yes. Mr. Uh, Representative Erdahl. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. And let me just add to that, uh, and I'm, I'm glad you've done surveys and you know, this is a huge problem for, for not just Greater Minnesota, but I'm sure the metro area as well. And I think we're looking at drops in the bucket here for what needs to be done. You know, you can't get people to come and live and work in Greater Minnesota if they have no place to live and nobody to take care of their children. And so I'm, I'm saying that I, I would like to see a greater emphasis in that area. Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you. Mr. Chair. Jay. Oh, sorry, Jay. Or Representative Mr. John. Sorry, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I don't know who this goes to, but the Minnesota Asian Pacific Caucus, we've been trying to have a meeting with the commissioner, and it has been being pushed off, being rescheduled for I don't know how long. And so I'm very disappointed that here you are today talking, coming to me and Chair Lee about these issues, but yet the issues in our very own community are not being addressed and we can't get a hold of the commissioner. And so at some point, I would like to meet the, with the commissioner as soon as possible to discuss some of the issues that we've been having hearing from our own communities. And so I don't know who it is that's gonna make that happen, but I would like to see that happen ASAP. 
Chair and members, I'm happy to take this up and reach out to the commissioner after this hearing. Representative Scrabble. Thank you, Chair Carroll. Um, and then this is, I'm, I'm in new territory here, but didn't last year's bill create a new childhood department? Uh, go ahead. Chair and members, part of the legislation that passed in the 2023 Please. session does create a new Department of Children, Youth, and Families. Mm -hmm. Mr. Chair. Yes. Um, Representative Either one, directors. Um, uh, do we, is that department going to be instituting these or do you still institute these? <laughs> Ms. Bailey, go ahead. Chair member, um, the new department will administer these dollars. We have in a separate bill kind of transfer authority as we finalize um, all of the programs that will transfer over um, the new that will be part of that bill. Yes, um, Mr. Mr. Chair, um, does that include the one? Uh, does the 1.2 billion that was passed include any monies for this or in that bill that was passed? Go ahead. Uh, Mr. Chair member, are you asking about the bonding bill from last year? Uh, Mr. Chair, no, I'm, I'm talking about the whole bill itself that, that created the whole new department, the dollars that built that new department. Were any of these projects included in that, in that 1.2 billion? Director Bailey. Uh, Mr. Chair member, um, no, there wasn't any programmatic funding um, in that bill related to these programs. Representative Scraba. Thank you, Mr. Chair. That's, thank you. Anyone else? Not seeing any, thank you. Next up is the Department of Administration. Go ahead and please introduce yourself when you're ready. Good afternoon, Chair, members. I'm Tamar Grumble. I'm the Commissioner of um, the Department of Administration, and with me is Assistant Commissioner Wayne Wozlowski and uh, Director of Real Estate and Construction, Greg Ewick. Please proceed. It's good to be with all of you today. I'm happy to share the details of admin's capital budget requests. And I've brought with me our subject matter experts for our property and facilities, and we're here to answer your questions. Um, our budget request has four parts. The first is parking equipment and technology improvements phase one. The governor recommends funds for admin to install parking access controls at facilities on the capital complex. This proposal is admin strategy to adapt to a modern workforce's parking needs and keep parking contract parking on the complex competitive. Capital Complex employees and visitors are looking for flexible parking options beyond monthly contracts. For instance, more options to park hourly for one day a month or to purchase a contract for a few days a week. Currently, admin is unable to provide that at most facilities because we don't have the equipment to determine the demand on the precise or the precise count of daily parkers. Installation of controls will provide us that usage data so we can better manage demand at facilities. This will minimize unnecessary parking space vacancies. Work will primarily start at the 14th Street ramp near the Stassen building, but we will update other facilities if funds allow. This proposal is admin strategy to offer more comprehensive parking amenities so the parking account remains stable. The design for this project is currently underway using parking and transit program funds, and the construction timeline of this project is anticipated to begin in the fall of 2024 and to be completed in the fall of 2025. The second of our four part request is the State Facility Renewable Energy and Storage Fund. In order to leverage funds from the Federal Inflation Reduction Act and improve the resiliency of agency operations, the governor recommends funding to install renewable energy systems and energy storage upgrades at state owned facilities. This proposal will make a real impact, especially for agencies with 24 seven operations, 
like the Department of Human Services, Corrections, and the Vets Homes, who often have the most inefficient state buildings. Potential renewable energy production systems and energy storage systems include solar arrays and geothermal heat pumps, among others. Eligible projects at state facilities can qualify for a reimbursement from the federal government of 30 to 50 percent of the cost to install these systems. The private sector has had access to these tax credits for many years, and recently the federal government has made them available to nonprofits and governmental entities. Admin will work with agencies to identify eligible projects and administer the logistics to receive the federal funds. A specific appropriation is needed because agencies don't have excess operating funds to complete these upgrades. The design for these projects would occur between July of 2024, so this July, and June of 2025, depending on the agency project. Construction for these projects is estimated to occur between January to December of 2025. And the third of the four part request. The governor recommends providing resources to implement additional security upgrades recommended by the Advisory Committee on Capital Area Security. These upgrades were identified in both the 2014 physical security study and the 2022 security assessment update. In addition to general obligation bonds, trunk highway funds will be utilized to make security upgrades to the transportation building, which was built with trunk highway bonds in 1958. This photo shows the new security kiosk in the admin building, which were made possible by a portion of the 10 million appropriated in 2018. While this funding has been much appreciated across the capital complex, considerable vulnerabilities remain, and so we are asking for resources to continue to make progress toward closing those gaps. The design for this project is anticipated to occur between July 2024 and March of 2025, and construction activities are estimated um, between June of 2025 and June of 2026. And finally, the governor recommends additional investment to maintain CAPRA. That's the acronym for the Capital Asset Preservation and Replacement Account. This account is the state's rainy day fund and covers emergency repairs and hazardous materials abatement for state agencies. These funds were utilized when agencies request funds from admin after an incident occurs that impacts state facilities or infrastructure. CAPRA is admin's portion of the governor's proposed asset preservation projects. Finally, I have a few updates on the appropriations from last year. The Sustainable Building Guidelines Recommendations Report was submitted and completed in October of last year. Uh, the Ford Demolition Project is 95% complete with some electrical mitigation remaining, and the construction of the tunnel access structure is anticipated to begin in April. The Capital Complex Security Upgrades Phase Two project is approximately 80% designed with work at the Veterans Services Building out for bid. The construction work will begin in May, and we hope to have all the work complete by the summer of 2025. Um, CAPRA bonds, we utilize these funds as agencies request them when emergencies arise, and that's what I mentioned in the four, um, number four of the four uh, part request. A little over $2 million was expended on eligible projects in 2023. Now I'll turn it over to Greg Ewig to highlight the processes that admin uses when managing state agency projects. Please identify yourself and proceed. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, my name is Greg Ewig. I'm the Senior Director for Real Estate and Construction Services at the Department of Administration. Uh, as the agency that manages the bulk of asset preservation projects for state agencies, I'm here to provide a high-level overview of the delivery, prioritization, and timeline of projects. First, our agencies in the state are best positioned with regular predictable investments made now that can significantly reduce future costs and maintain project momentum. Agencies can then avoid Im negative impacts on their service delivery uh, by investing in these critical projects well before any infrastructure approaches failure. Uh, investments allow the Department of Administration and agencies to team up to deliver asset preservation programs promptly, efficiently, and transparently. And asset preservation pri priorities are established by the agencies, as you're hearing today. Each agency forecasts their needs based on annually updated facilities condition assessments, uh, which is compiled in our state enterprise tool to identify deferred maintenance for our buildings and building systems. Uh, the agencies use that data to focus on critical life safety and programmatic needs, taking into account their particular mission and priorities. 
So, you know, we've, you've probably heard a lot of these presentations. Uh, there's a lot of words that kind of bounce around, around encumbrance, expenditures, allotment, and appropriation. Uh, here's a quick little uh, overview of how we keep it all straight. So as you all know, the legislature passes the bill that the governor signs that appropriates funds to a state agency or local jurisdiction. The agency takes that appropriation and allots it or budgets those funds towards a particular asset preservation project within their program based on a priority list that they maintain. Uh, the Department of Administration, as the construction manager for the agency, encumbers those funds prior to signing contracts for designers or contractors. And lastly, we manage the expenditure of funds uh, after the contractor delivers those services. Uh, whether or not a state asset preservation project has been encumbered doesn't necessarily indicate project readiness or project start to completion. Um, all agencies have a priority list, but the allotment the agency makes to a particular project may change somewhat depending on the amount received. An encumbrance is usually issued in advance of design and prior to construction and traditional design bid build process. Uh, just by contrast, uh, local projects on the other hand do show 100% encumbered as soon as they enter into a grant agreement, uh, regardless of the status of their project. This is just a, a high level overview uh, illustrating the, pro the overall process for a typical project, uh, starting as early as the initial uh, uh, request being made in the capital budget process uh, prior to the legislative session, moving all the way through uh, at various stages from funding, design, bid, and construction. Uh, and with that, we'll thank you for your consideration, and the commissioner and the team here will stand ready for any questions about the capital budget or related projects. Thank you. Members, any questions? Representative Virgil. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. And notice how well this was working today. Uh, Commissioner, my mic fell to the floor last time I was here. That's what, uh, uh, I thought you were talking about the chair. <laughs> uh, Commissioner, um, just going back to the Capitol Complex security upgrades, just uh, some questions. Um, the, you're making upgrades recommended by the Advisory Committee on Capital Security in 2014, so that's 10 years ago. I mean, is it customary to take 10 years to react to a report, or uh, are, are there items that you have considered that, that, that are already happening, a, a certain percentage, percentage of that? Mr. Chair? Yes. Commissioner Grumble. Uh, representative, uh, that's a good question. I, I will, I can answer at a very high level, um, given that I'm just five months into this job and I can defer to the subject matter experts that are with me today to answer it more precisely. But the uh, recommendations, admin has not always received funding, adequate funding to implement the recommendations in the reports. That's why there's so much time has passed and all the recommendations um, need to be funded in order to be implemented. But I will certainly um, can offer Either follow, up, uh, either follow up with you or offer um, one of our subject matter experts to provide additional information. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. Um, Representative Erdo. Assistant Commissioner Oslowski, who I expect to know pretty much everything about this stuff. Mr. Chair. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, one of the things that we did in the restoration of the Capitol was to make sure, or at least try to ensure, that uh, we didn't run into crises situations, that there is money available for ongoing needs. Uh, how is that working? Mr. Mr. Chair, uh, Representative Erdahl, uh, for the record, uh, Wayne Wislowski, Assistant Commissioner of the Department of Administration. Um, that is uh, working very well. So just uh, for context, as part of the Castor Capital Restoration Project, uh, we did a um, had our consultants put together how much funding is needed uh, so we do not get into a crisis situation and what's the regular cadence of that work. Um, and so starting as um, uh, for last year, for example, um, over the summer, you would have noticed that there was cranes up around the Capitol and there were that, so that was additional tuck pointing work uh, that was happening in accordance with that scheduled maintenance. So that is now built into a, a ongoing maintenance program and 
we continue to update, update the funding that's needed for that. So every two years we're coming back to the legislature um, indicating what funding's needed. We also submit an annual uh, preservation report for the capital um, and in that we also indicate how much ongoing funding is needed. And so far we've been keeping up with that the, with the support of the legislature um, with, with those funding requests. Mr. Chair. Yes. Uh, thank you. One more quick question. And uh, maybe this is uh, uh, Mr. Wozlowski as well. Uh, the majority of the capital complex is still without security upgrades. Um, should we, or, or why didn't we do that as part of the capital renovation, the security upgrades? Mr. Wozlowski. Mr. Chair, uh, Representative Ertl, um, with capital restoration, it originally obviously had a very significant price tag involved um, and the original direction was to stay within the footprint of the building. As, as you know, as things were discovered on the exterior with the stairs and, and some of the waterproofing, uh, the Preservation Commission uh, approved expanding that scope. Um, and then there was funds left over when funds were left over at the end of capital restoration, the legislature approved using those fundings for taking care of some of the asset preservation needs that our memorials on the campus had. Um, so that essentially, the, the security was de deemed to be for the campus on a separate track in accordance with that task force that was set up. Um, and uh, as the commissioner indicated, you know that's an ongoing uh, conversation uh, with the legislature on and to get the funding needed and then to keep that up to date with current the current threat environment for the campus so um, it's more of a progressive thing we obviously think it's a high priority for the campus and I think the task force supports that as well Representative Riddle, one more uh, thank you it's just a quick statement mr. chairman uh, I just want to comment uh, assistant uh, commissioner Wasowski about uh, it was a pleasure working with you on the capital restoration. Uh, I'm glad that we were able to do some good things and that you were a big part of it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Representative. Thank you, Commissioner Cronwell. Thank you all. Representative oh. Scrava, did you have just, just, oh, oh, One second. Yeah. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I didn't realize he had a question. Sorry, sorry, um, Chair. Um, and. Any of any of you can answer this, or whoever wants to. Uh, the the 1.5 million in general fund for um, reducing a energy costs. Uh, you, you mentioned the corrections, uh, and the states allowed into it. Um, do, and what is the match from the federal government to that 1.5 million? Is it 75, 50 percent is the max? Mr. Chair, go Mr. ahead. Chair. Uh, Representative, um, it, it's a brand new tax program essentially, and it's being available, it's become available for the first time. So we are still determining that. I think it depends on the project. Um, right now we're, I think, being conservative and saying 30 to 50%. Of course, if a project ends up being more than that, um, that would be fantastic. Mr. Chair. Yes. So the total amount we have available for this state facility renewable energy storage fund is 1.5 million. That 1.5 is the request at this time. And what what is available? Is there more in the fund, or is just to help put more into the fund? Commissioner Granville. Um, Representative, this is essentially the beginning of the fund. Okay. So. There are agencies that have some projects underway that we will apply for, um, but there are several agencies that don't have any funds at all to begin um, projects um, that will bring us those rebates or those credits. So this is the money to get it started. Right. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Lilly. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just quickly, um, have you thought about like um, uh, for the parking, have you thought about like pricing? If you go to a play or something, you have to pay a premium and there's a great big sequoia that's like right outside the door of our parking ramp and it seems like they should pay like a premium. You don't have to comment. <laughs> All right, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Commissioner Granville. Thank you. Next up is the Department of Education.
Welcome to the committee. Please identify yourself and proceed for the record. Good afternoon. My name is Bobby Burnham and I serve as the Assistant Commissioner for the Office of Teaching and Learning, of which State Library Services is a part of. I'm here this afternoon to talk about the Governor's Capital Budget Recommendation for the Library Construction Grants. Just a little background on Minnesota Public Libraries. There are 12 regional public library systems with 359 library locations, public library locations. We have eight bookmobiles and at least one library in every county. And some 2022 usage numbers. So in 2022, there was 13 uh, point five million visits to the library. That's up from 2021 20, from 9.7. 53 million items borrowed up from 43 million in 2021. And the library system directors report a surge in patrons wanting to borrow materials, attend in-person meetings and programming and access technology, all in person. Many library system directors also report demand for meeting space is very high among the many uses of these spaces. Directors also report um, that it is based on or focused on telehealth meetings and the need to update meeting rooms with adequate soundproofing and privacy measures is very high. The library construction grant program uh, there are two types, the improvement um, project type and accessibility. This grant program requires a minimum local match of 50% in the process is a competitive review process. Improvement projects include new construction, renovation of existing library facilities, repair of existing library facilities, which means lots of leaky roofs and weathered brickwork. The need is high also for air handling, such as HVAC systems. Accessibility projects include um, mediation of physical barriers, preventing access for all, such as automatic doors, ADA compliant restrooms, and upgraded lighting. The picture on this slide is from Kimball Library, which was awarded 440,000 in 2019 for construction of the new facility. They went from 1,010 square feet to 4,200 square feet. 2024 recommendation and interest is the governor recommends 1 million for the library construction competitive grant program. This program enables public libraries receiving funding to improve access and again, meet those ADA compliance standards by removing architectural barriers and replacing deficient facilities. The Council of Regional Public Library System Administrators, also known as CRIPSLA, collects the data for public library capital investment needs each year. For the estimated unmet need, which on your slide says 89 million, I just received data this morning updating this number and the actual figure is 194 million statewide. Picture in this library is of Cloquet, which was awarded 784,000 for a 7,000 square foot expansion, which focused on children and teen services, public programming and meeting space. Program data, this program has been funded 15 times from 1994 to 2003. The appropriations have ranged from 1 million to 4 million. To this date, seven or 170 awards have been made. The average award is about 108,000, the largest being a million to Fergus Falls in 2018, and the smallest being 614 to White Bear Lake in 1996. The average local match is $6.27 per local per state dollar. The last appropriations were 2.95 million in October of 2020 and in May of 23, 4 million. 
Libraries in 70 of the 87 counties have re applied and received grants, 40 projects sure. total in the seven county metro area, and 130 projects in greater Minnesota. The four million allocation in 2023 applications um, for this round of grants is currently open. More information in the application documents are available on the MDE webpage. The applications are due May 17th. The total amount is 4 million. Maximum grant amount is a million for improvement grants and 450,000 for accessibility grants. And that's all I have for you today for Thank the you. library construction grant program. Representative Vertal, oh. you have a question? I've talked too much. Oh. We're tag teaming. All right, go ahead. Um, okay, that's how you use the mic, Dean. We'll just move it toward you. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, question here. So we have estimated need is just over $89 million statewide. Could you give us a rationale for just a million dollar request? Or do you have more money that's sitting in an account? Um, I understand that's what the governor is requesting, but I'm just curious with 89 million statewide that is needed. Mr. Chair, Representative, that is the amount that um, my team has um, been given from the governor's office. And um, that's the amount we're working with for this year. Thank you. Oh, proceed. Mr. Chair, committee members, my name is Ado Shuni. I'm the Director of Government Relations for the Minnesota Department of Education. And today I'm going to be providing a update on the Federal Community Facility Projects grant opportunity. Uh, just as a reminder, I'll level set where we are with that proposal and then talk about where we're, where we're going. So this is a U.S. Department of Treasury grant awarded uh, to Minnesota for $50 million. Uh, we applied, uh, I believe, early on in, in 2023, found out last fall, um, that, and that's when our application was accepted. The grants uh, will fund multi-purpose community facility projects to areas that will benefit the most from support to address uh, challenges from uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. And this will focus uh, th on supports for education, work, health focused on uh, advancing family economic stability, connections, and educational opportunity for our state's children and youth. And we know that uh, the communities most dramatically impacted by the pandemic have been communities of color, indigenous communities, and low-income communities. So we know that many of these projects, if not all, will go to areas that service, uh, that provide services for these communities. My apologies. <coughs> uh, the projects uh, themselves have to be designed uh, to jointly and directly, as I mentioned, enable work, education, and health monitoring. But these uh, activities don't have to be the exclusive function or purpose of the project. So for example, a building such as a library or community center providing the public with access to computers with high-speed internet service can meet the criteria if, even if the project, uh, completed project is also used for other <coughs> functions such as community recreational activities. Recipients have to commit that the capital projects will provide services or activities that directly enable these uh, things like work, education, and health monitoring for at least five years from the completion of the project. And some of the eligible projects listed here are family resource centers, full service community schools, and those would include components such as school-based health centers. Family resource centers can also be within full service community schools, gymnasiums and community kitchen spaces, uh, school library and media centers, which are attached to full service community schools or partner with them. Um, and early childhood facilities um, that obviously meet the funding eligibility criteria. Libraries that on their own um, are eligible participants and they would include the related components such as community meeting spaces, computer labs, mobile community centers, wor and workforce spaces. And then finally community centers um, and their related components would be gymnasiums and community kitchen spaces and then also early childhood facilities and those also would have to meet the funding eligibility criteria. So 
Where are we with the grant now? We originally estimated that this federal grant opportunity would be ready for posting this spring. Um, we are in work with our partners um, who will be working on distribution uh, in different parts of the state. We're looking at Greater Twin Cities United Way for the metro area as well as the Minnesota Initiative Foundations partnering with them uh, for distribution in Greater Minnesota. Um, we are still working on those uh, setting up the logistics and we want to get this right. And so now we're looking at late spring to early, uh, to early summer um, for getting those set up for the grant opportunities to be available. Um, the, this would leave us about two to two and a half years of an award period, so that's July uh, or before that of this year until December of 26. And then uh, facilities funded would provide the required services for at least five years from the date of their completion. So that would be looking at those services being provided uh, until December of 2031. Thank you. Representative Scrava. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and uh, Director Uni. Um, one of the questions, we, we toured a lot of sites this year, and in the metro area, we did a lot of uh, resource centers, uh, things like that. Uh, uh, can they, if they get bonding money can they use that for matching for the federal dollars? Can that money match? Assistant Commissioner. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Representative Scriba, um, that is a good question. I'll have to go back to the team and ask what can be used as matching funds for, for these projects. I'm not sure to that, so I don't want to misspeak on the record, but I'll come back and, and provide that information. What, Mr. Chair, yeah. What, one of the, if, if, if you could put more in than we put in, that would lighten our load a little bit, is what I'm trying to find out. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. All right, uh, thank you, uh, Comm Assistant Commissioner and, and Director. Next up is the Minnesota Amateur Sports Commission. Finally. Welcome to the committee. Deputy Director Ladd, please identify yourself and proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Neil Ladd, Deputy Executive Director for the National Sports Center Foundation and the Minnesota Amateur Sports Commission. I think I need to start off today by saying I'm sorry we did not bring any animals and we didn't bring a bookmobile. So, but we did bring a good story. The Amateur Sports Commission uh, is always shovel ready when you allocate funds to them. Right, Gets out the door very, very quickly. So I'll go through these questions um, briefly, and if you have any questions, please feel free to interrupt me. Um, in 2023, the legislature appropriated $9.6 million for asset preservation on the campus of the National Sports Center. And I'm happy to report today that all 9.6 has been encumbered and is being spent in the following categories. Field renovation and reconstruction, we've spent just over $4.3 million. And if you think about the last six months, we've put in 16 miles of mainline irrigation in the wintertime. Unbelievable. Uh, ADA compliance, pedestrian vehicle improvements. The sports center was built in 1990 prior to the ADA law. So we've spent over a million dollars just bringing the facility up in some of those crisis categories uh, up to compliance. Super rink renovation, just over a million dollars. That's the start of the project and I'll talk about that later. And then campus infrastructure, floodplain mitigation, rooftop units, air handlers, lift stations, system replacements just a little over $3.3 million. All of that was done um, with the plan, knowing that once the funds were available, we would have them spent and completed on the projects in 2024. Any questions on that? Members? Thank you. I'll move on to then uh, 2024. The Amateur Sports Commission asked for $22 million for that super rink renovation. Uh, the governor has allocated uh, the $9.2 million that you have seen. That will be for a R22 changeout and addressing some of the major issues that that building has. And I'll just digress just for a second. That building has $2 million of Mighty Ducks money into it. It's currently valued at $66 million and is a state asset. 
If you think about the return on investment, it's a great return on investment, but even a better investment by the state of Minnesota when you think about what their investment was on in the beginning. What we're planning on doing with that R22 changeout, um, we will start construction sometime in July of 24 with a completion in early 27. Lead times on chillers, compressors, and some of the main, main manufactured parts in those buildings are 56 to 62 weeks. So we will have to get started immediately. Uh, we run the risk of having downtime and we can have lots of uh, citizens who use that facility on a daily basis and we need to get that work done. Like I said, the construction will start in 24 and we're hoping to be done in 26, but it might take uh, just a few months into 2027. One other recommendation for 2024 was the $1 million for the James Metzen Mighty Ducks grant program. The Amateur Sports Commission met last week and allocated its last 800 and some thousand dollars to the projects that were available and ready to go in 2024. The million dollars would be teed up uh, for at least another 1.6 to 1.8 million dollars of projects that are in queue. And we believe over the next two years, you may have in excess of $3 million of projects that would be ready to go when cities know that these funds are available. Very good program, uh, touches every inch of the state. And as we all know, it was a good public policy decision way back when, when this project was instituted. Just read this very clear. With that, Thank you. I'll take any questions. Representative West. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, my question is, outside of bonding, what uh, appropriation does the Amateur Sports Commission get to run the National Sports Center from the state? Thank you, Mr. Chair, members. Um, the Amateur Sports Commission biannual budget is about $350,000. There's three employees and meeting per diems, and that's about all that's received. But they take that $3.5 million or three point five. $350,000 and turn it into a $16 million asset called the National Sports Center Foundation, which generates roughly 70 to $80 million of economic impact annually. Any follow-up, Representative West? Sounds like a bargain for the state, I would say. All right, not seeing any other questions. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Good job, man. <laughs> Next up is uh, Minnesota State Academies. Welcome to the committee. Superintendent Wilding, please identify yourself for the record and proceed. Good afternoon. I am Superintendent Terry Wilding. I run both the School for the Deaf and the School for the Blind in Faribault, Minnesota. Just giving you a short overview, some of you have come and visited our campus. Some of you have not met our area quite yet. We are funded fully by the state. The deaf and blind students on campus in Faribault serve all of the students in the state of Minnesota. We are one of the oldest public schools in the state of Minnesota. We've served kids throughout the state in all ages. Currently, we serve from infants, zero, birth to age 22. We follow the special education laws, IDEA. We also serve kids of 50 to 60 different school districts, sometimes more, sometimes less, in the state of Minnesota. We have two campuses. Both are very old. Uh, the buildings have been over 100 years in the making. Uh, at the blind school and the deaf school, we also serve students with additional physical and cognitive challenges on both campuses. We have about 40% of our students that sleep in our dorms on campus. This is where our students live during the week and go home on the weekends. Our students receive special ed services. That means all of our students have individual education plans, health services, dietary needs, supervision. Our teachers follow the Pillsby licensing and resources are available to our students as well as our families and school districts statewide. How we are funded. Most schools in Minnesota are able to go through a levy system, uh, earn from the taxpayers. We are not. 
Purpage and us are fully funded by the state of Minnesota. We depend on you for our construction, for our maintenance, for our programming. We do not qualify for other uh, items as other school districts do. Currently, we have three requests in the hopper uh, in the governor's recommendations. A pre-design for a student center, a pre-design for our blind school therapy pool, and then asset preservation funds. On the deaf school campus, we have several very old buildings, and some of you have seen those in the past. Uh, they're decrepit. We can't use them anymore. Some of them do not have energy efficiency. They're hard to maintain. They're hard to staff. Sometimes issues pop up. Uh, we have workman comp issues because of the building itself and the design is not maintained very well. With the design money, we would like to have someone come in and evaluate our campus to make recommendations for replacement. We want to remove some of the excess square footage to reduce our footprint to give us uh, ability to maintain and save state dollars in the long run. The goal is to try and replace up to five of the older buildings to have one centralized student center. This would include our gym, our athletics, our food service, as well as our co consumer tech programming would be in one building. And that would save us in uh, staffing as well as maintenance costs. Those five buildings, we have asked for asset preservation funds. We've expended quite a bit of money to keep them current as much as we can and use the facility as best as we are able to. So that is what the, re the reduction of asset preservation funds would come after we uh, demolish those five buildings. The student center, uh, times have changed. There's more and more kids with physical access needs, wheelchairs, many of our buildings do not have that accessibility feature. Currently, uh, our buildings do not meet code. It is not efficient. If you come into our gym and you can see the outside in the cracks of the walls, we want to try and make our buildings more energy efficient. We also want to have it fit our student needs. That is the goal for the deaf school campus. Our next project is the therapy pool replacement. We have a very old therapy pool and spa, similar to a hot tub. And we want to emphasize this is not for recreation use. Many of our students who have physical challenges uh, at the blind school also have a need for stretching or they sit in different devices all day long. And for them to continue to learn and be able to be put into those therapy pools, it allows them to stretch and also improves their education as they exit the pool, their attention span is much better. So that therapy pool, once again, we've expended quite a bit of money in replacing, we've piecemealed it together, but it is time to just look at replacement to a new pool. The emphasis of this is not, it's our pool currently is not accessible, we have a chair lift a one chair lift. We have to bring one student in at a time into the pool and exit one student at a time. We are hoping that our new pool would be walk-in zero gravity. It would be safer for our staff and our students to enter and exit the pool. We would need a designer to come in and redesign the pool area. We also would have related impact on our roads the fencing that is connected to the DOC. So we would have to look at a bigger picture and see how we could solve some con con contingency issues with them. At the blind school, we have more and more than half of our students are have physical challenges. So we're seeing a larger need for this pool. Our last request is ongoing for asset preservation. This is to make improvements, maintain, and make sure that the safety and accessibility of our environment for our students is applicable. In the past, we have had ongoing maintenance and improvements, and as I mentioned, our campus is very old. Our buildings are, uh, we have two buildings that are on the historical registry, which requires even a higher level of 
complexity as you look at maintaining and improvements in those buildings. We're looking at replacing boilers, adjusting our tuck pointing, our roof, safety for doors and windows, asbestos removal, accessibility for our bathrooms, HVAC improvements. Some of them are smaller projects, some of them are larger projects with larger price tags. The most critical needs right now are the life and safety and the accessibility as well as our program needs. We're taking a look at the priorities to try to reduce and maintain the liability to the state. Most of our buildings, except for one, were built before the 1990s. So we are not following the ADA. We have to make accommodations and modifications as we go. The safety and security wasn't considered back then. Faribault was a small town. Now we have more and more safety concerns and our students and families want to be protected. We have vulnerable adults. We have kids such as babies as 12 months old on campus and kids with cognitive challenges. We want to make sure that our buildings and campus are safe for all families. You asked about asset preservation and what we had spent it on in years past. We replaced the roof on two historical buildings, which was a huge challenge because of the old uh, issues as well as following code and the historical outlook. Those will both be completed this spring. The classroom instruction replacing windows, access, doors, uh, the classroom, uh, replacing the flooring as well in those classrooms. The HVAC in some of the buildings was also on the docket to be replaced. Last year you funded us and we are in the process of beginning those doors in the school buildings will be replaced, the safety access. We're also looking at the walk-in freezer. Currently we are not meeting health codes with that walk-in freezer needs to be replaced. ADA lifts for two of our stages on our campus. Right now, we do not have a way for wheelchair students to be on our stage. So for performances, student activities and plays, they are not able to be up there. Asbestos removal is in one of the buildings at the blind school. Uh, also our playgrounds. We mentioned that we have more and more kids in wheelchairs. Right now, we have those physical challenges, but our playgrounds aren't accessible. It is bark and our kids can't access the swing sets, they can't play with their classmates, so we're looking at changing the design of accessibility on our playgrounds. And that is in the next few months. We are working with RECs uh, for those projects to design and approve and get the permissions and permits in place. That is all I have today. I thank you again for your support, and do you have any questions for me at this time? Members, any questions? Representative Erdl. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair and uh, Mr. Wilding, just one quick question. How many students do you have? Director Wilding. Yes, we are, we did lose a lot of students over COVID. We are at about 150. We're continuing to grow. At the deaf school, we had 32 no, new enrollments this year. And at the blind school, we had uh, seven to nine new enrollments. Uh, two of them are still on their way getting to our school. Representative uh, Ms. Chair, so, so the total is what? A little bit under 150. I believe it's 147 at this time. It'll be 150 by the end of the year. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Superintendent Wildy. Thank you. Last up is the Perfect Center for the Arts. Welcome to the committee, Dr. Rick and Director Top. Please identify yourself for the record and proceed.
screen is completely blank. I can't see. <laughs> Why, Ray, I'm Sorry. Good afternoon, Chair. My name is uh, Charles Rick. I'm the Executive Director for the Perkins Center for Arts Education. And Could you put the mic in front of you, please? I uh, sure. Thank you. There you go. Please proceed. Uh, again, Mr. Chair, I'm uh, Charles Rick. I'm the executive director of the Kirby Center for Arts Education, and joining me is John Tolp. He is our finance director. So we're going to be both answering, doing our presentation today. Anyway, um, I think you all have a copy of our presentation. So I, what I'm going to do, you can go to, and I'm going to start with, with uh, we include a map of where Perpich is located in Golden Valley. And then the next slide is uh, our unique roles. As said, uh, Perpich is a state agency and we have a unique role in education in Minnesota. Uh, two areas, One's, one we have a residential arts high school and we have students from all over Minnesota attending there. Currently, we, uh, this year we have 36 of 87 counties, 91 school districts, and representation from all eight congressional districts. Could I just uh, interrupt you for a second? Members, please refer to the hand, please refer to the handout in your materials for the presentation. Proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Graduation rate is 100% coming out of Perpich. Students, when they attend Perpich, uh, come with high academic standards. Also, on it was a picture of a map there, the state of Minnesota, which shows where all the students come from. And it's hard to see in your handout, but it, it's, uh, they represent, again, a wide base Minnesota. Second, we have professional development resource programs. Again, there is a map of Minnesota where we have touched all these places in the past year. Uh, we have worked with 211 school districts and charter schools. We've connected with educators in all 67 Minnesota Senate districts. Uh, we have a statewide arts library in Perpich, and any resident of Minnesota can join the library and have access to a wide ranging catalog of resources, which includes extensive art education resources. Next slide. Uh, this is our slide that we're very proud of. This is awards and news. Uh, class of 2023, you can see there a list of our students who have received recognition so far for their accomplishments and recognition, both statewide and nationalwide. Also, uh, we have professional de development and resource programs, more commonly known as PDR. Uh, the focus is on this year we, we are doing outreach to Tier 1 and two, Tier 2 art educators working with the Minnesota Department of Education in Pelsby. We have a new Native author series, and we also are doing a media arts educator cohort. And the library is a collection of Native authors, and they're focused on Dakota and Ojibwe authors. They're quite extensive um, collection of books and by authors uh, for people to read and, t and, and take out. Next slide. On my next slide, now I'm going to turn it over to John Tope. He is going to talk about asset preservation overview. Please identify, identify yourself and proceed. Thank you. Mr. Chair, uh, John Tope, Finance Director at Purpage Center. Uh, just a quick overview on the asset preservation funds that have been uh, given to us uh, in the recent past. Obviously, these asset preservation funds preserve our existing in infrastructure. They re reflect our strategic plan and they also develop uh, potential operating budget savings for Perpich. Uh, in 2020, we were awarded $750,000, and in 2023, we were awarded $891,000. On the next slide, uh, the 2020 appropriation was used for grounds repair and sidewalk repair. We have $170,000 approximately left uh, we have encumbered 145,000 of that $170,000, and uh, 
and we uh, are identifying additional areas for repair to encumber the rest of those funds. In 2023, we were awarded the $891,000. That was primarily to replace the roof on our Gaia building, which is our professional development and research building for Perpich. Uh, additionally, uh, there are some precast concrete panels and you have a picture of that in your PowerPoint presentation where there, there are cracks going uh, horizontally across those precast concrete panels that we will need to uh, address. I'll turn it back over to Dr. Rick. On our next slide, which shows our asset um, preservation request list. It's called the per, the per capita budget request. We are requesting $4 million in capital requests. And the governor's recommendation, the recommendation is for $1.623 million in AP funds. And you can see on the slide where we list the different priorities that we currently have. And the next slide, I'm going to begin to address more specific uh, projects. A project that's been on the list for as long as I've been there and longer is to restroom updates. There was a study done in 2016 in the main building and what they found was building code violations, restroom doors are non-compliant, ADA code compliant, so we need additional stalls, accessories, fixtures, and additional fixtures are needed in a building this size. Uh, we required 44 fixtures and currently we have 33. And you see a picture of one of the bathrooms uh, at Perpage, which is the male bathroom on the main floor of the main building. Next slide. For 2024 recommendations, uh, working off of the governor's recommendation of 1.623 million, uh, we are want to address the restroom situation in Perpage in the main building, starting there and then prioritizing from there. And the project timeline would include the design and scope of the project and once funds became available the review and design of the project we could begin in as early as July 2024 and once the project analysis is completed the next step would be to obtain approval for the project and a timeline to take into consideration one consideration we do need to take into account there is we run the arts high school calendar which uh, students return in August and they're there through the end of May. And so that could impact the construction taking place within the school at that time. So the best time for contractors on campus is June to August. But you can see there what the project includes, um, things like the plumbing system, the fixtures, ADA concerns. And depending on the money available, we, this could extend all the way into the Gaia building and also the resident dorm. Funds would be used for the, all these projects. I don't believe 1.623 million is going to do all the projects, so we kind of want to put together uh, order of priorities. And as money becomes more available in the future, uh, we could then go ahead and uh, start working on those priorities. In the Gaia building, the main priority for this year is the roof replacement and then the exterior precast panel repair. And we recently had a st uh, meeting with the architect and we're beginning to think now that maybe the dollars that we allocated are thinking are not going to be enough based on what he's telling us and based on we've had a meeting with uh, consultants now just last week. And so that uh, 891000 we don't know that'll be enough. Also, um, on the exterior precast, that would, uh, again, the, like you saw a picture, they're cracked and, and they need to be uh, repaired. And just last week, late last week, I became aware of that on the resident dorm, the exterior panels also need repair now. So those are projects that uh, we're looking at including uh, should this money become available. And again, the whole I, for us is the prioritizing of funds, asset preservation funds, uh, and we'll, we'll do what we can with what we receive. Thank you, Dr. Rick. Uh, Vice Chair Ryer. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Director, for being here. Uh, I'm very pleased because one of my priorities is uh, access for people with disabilities and accessibility. Thank you for the work there. Uh, I'm interested to know where uh, you are in terms of your facilities with gender neutral 
uh, restrooms and facilities uh, and whether you have a deficit there that you that you would be also including this what's the status and what are your plans thanks uh, currently we do have a gender neutral restroom identified for students in the main building and we'll continue to look at other options but we do have one identified which is located uh, where most of the students are during the school day we have three excuse me I have my communication directors here with me um, so we have three spaces provided already Vice Chair Ryer. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Director. Uh, so does that include for in the residences, for example, so that all students will feel comfortable using shower facilities um, and the like? What, what's the status there? Thanks. Chair, Representative, in the dorm you're talking about? Uh, right now, it came about because of COVID. Uh, right now, we have a lot of the rooms are single occupants. And that is a concern going forward, too, whether you have double occupants or single with the students we have. There is room for 140 students in the dorm and, and they do have shower facilities, but that would be another project that we would need to get on our list to upgrade all the shower and sink facilities in the dorm as well. Thank you. Representative Ergel. Uh, thank you, Ms. Chair and uh, Dr. Rick. Uh, how many students do you have and how many instructors? Chair and Representative, we have, at my last count, we have, I want, we have 143 students, and our staff, I believe, is 24 FTEs or 25 FTEs. Representative Ergel. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair and Dr. Rick. How many stay on campus of the, the students? Uh, current, Go ahead. Chair and Representative, currently um, for this year, we're somewhere in the neighborhood. I want to say 80. 283 students are currently living in the dorm, and most of them are, it's all single occupancy at this point. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rick and, and Director Topp. Appreciate your being here. Thank you, Chair. Members, next hearing is Wednesday, March 20th. On the agenda, among other things, is Minnesota Historical Society bonding request, presentation uh, on the state auditor report on infrastructure stress transparency tool and we'll help hear two bills one of which is uh, chair chair Lee's actually both chair Lee's thank you members we're adjourned